Is that okay? That's okay. 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 So I'll begin now. Uh, Sudi Oscar Kipchumba, uh, the applicant hereafter, is a Kenyan citizen. Uh, he presented himself to the police on the 13th of September 2020 after learning that the police were looking for him and after the police had camped outside his house the previous few hours. The applicant's home is in Kapseret, where the applicant also happens to be the area member of parliament. Upon his surrender at Langas Police Station in Wasingishu County, the applicant was brought to Nakuru Central Police Station. The following day, he was presented before the Chief Magistrate, Tenan J. B. Carlo, uh, in a miscellaneous application. The Republic, through the NCIC, sought leave to, uh, of the court to detain the applicant for 14 days, to give it an opportunity to conclude investigations and bring charges against him. In his application in the lower court, the Republic stated that it is doing investigations with a view to bringing five charges against the applicant as follows. Hate speech, uh, assault of a police officer, offensive conduct, unlawful possession of firearms and ammunition, contrary to section 103 of the National Police Service Act. The learned magistrate had both parties and reserved a ruling for the 16th of September 2020. In his considered ruling, the learned magistrate held that the Republic had made out a case for the continued detention of the applicant for a further period of seven days. The applicant believes that the decision by the learned magistrate is patently erroneous and amenable to revision or review by this court pursuant uh, to the provisions of Article 165 of the Constitution Sections 123, 362, and 364 of the Criminal Procedure Code. He has therefore filed the instant application dated 17th of September 2020, uh, basically uh, seeking orders of reversal of the lower court ruling. The matter was placed before me under certificate of urgency yesterday, that is the 17th of September. Owing to the nature of the subject matter and its urgency, I directed the applicant's lawyers to serve the DPP and return today for the parties hearing. In doing so, I considered it critical uh, to hear from the state before making any substantive or consequential decision on the matter. As directed, the parties appeared before me today for oral conversing of the application. I've carefully considered the oral representations of the parties' advocates, the constitutional and statutory authorities cited, as well as the decision of law quoted. I have also considered the skeletal submissions filed by the applicant's lawyers. I'm grateful to all the counsel who addressed the court, Mr. Nelson Harvey, uh, Mr. Nathan Torre, and Mr. Hillary um, Sige, on behalf of the applicant, and Mr. Daniel Karuri uh, for the DPP. Each one of them was resplendent in their blend of erudition and brevity. I should begin by dealing with a potentially dispositive procedural matter raised by Mr. Karui for the DPP. That is, that it was a mistake for the applicant to have approached the court by way of revision as opposed to preferring an appeal. He argued that the applicant is not really advancing arguments about the regularity or illegality of the proceedings, but is dissatisfied with the decision of the learned magistrate. They, therefore, ought to have appealed against it. Mr. Harvey's response was that a revision was an appropriate step since no charge had been preferred against the applicant yet, and in any event, the Supreme Court has recently reiterated in the Joseph Landrix waswa case that interlocutory appeals in criminal matters ought to be referred until the final determination of the criminal trial. This is a path not open to the applicant given the nature of the application, Mr. Harvey argued. In R versus R. Louis Stevenson, I dealt with a variant of this question and held as follows. In my view, the CPC provisions do not, however, mean that a party which has a right of appeal cannot thereby invoke the court's power to review a magistrate's court's order or decision. For clarification, it is important to state the right position that the High Court will usually exercise the power to review, to even exercise an appeal of an interlocutory matter before magistrate's court only in exceptional circumstances. 
While it's difficult to determine the mathematical precision when the court will use this power, it is only it is only despairingly used where, in the words of South African authors Gardner and Lansdowne, grave injustice might otherwise result, or where justice might not be uh, by, uh, may not by other means be attained. As the authors correctly write, the court will generally hesitate to intervene, especially having regard to the effect of such a procedure upon the continuity of proceedings in the court below. Hence, the propriety of exercising revision power for interlocutory matters is decided on the facts of each case and with due regard to the salutary general rule that appeals are not entertained in this way. In the present case, the applicant's counsel, as the applicant's counsel noted, there is no criminal trial. What is before the subordinate court are miscellaneous proceedings where a ruling has been made to the applicant in the charge detention. Both the terms of the criminal procedure code, as well as the radically liberalized revisionary powers of the High Court donated in Article 265 of the Constitution, clearly permit the applicant to approach this court for revision at the need. I will now turn to the substantive issues. The singular question presented by this application is whether, in balancing the rights of the applicant, the interests of justice and public order, peace and security, in the circumstances of this case, there are compelling reasons to warrant the continued free charge detention of the applicant at the subordinate court held. In reaching the conclusion that such free charge detention is warranted, the landed magistrate reasoned as follows. It was submitted on the quoting from the uh, landed magistrate. It was submitted on behalf of the applicant, that is the state, that the respondent made certain utterances that the applicant says amount to hate speech, which triggered demonstrations against the respondent and its release from custody. At this particular moment will disturb public order and security. The court is invited to balance between public interest and the right of the respondent to be released on bond. In the peculiar circumstances of this case, the court finds the public interest override the respondent's right to be released on bond at this stage, end of court. A second reason the law court uh, gives for the continued recharge detention of the applicant is that the applicant is likely to interfere with potential uh, witnesses. The learned magistrate reasons that, they quote, the respondent applicant is uh, the respondent, that is the applicant here, is a member of parliament for Katsaret constituency. It is clear from the commotion that occurred at the respondent's home on the night of Friday, uh, Friday 12 September, when the police attempted to arrest him, that the respondent is a person of immense influence, and the likelihood of him interfering with witnesses is real. As was held in the case of uh, Sebastian Miriti, if the accused can influence witnesses, be it subtly or even through threats, it is a fact to be considered. The respondent is likely to influence potential witnesses. End of quote. The applicant insists that the court fundamentally misapprehended both law and the facts in its analysis and, and findings. In particular, in both the documents he has filed before this court, as well as in the oral arguments of his advocates before me, the applicant makes the following four points. First, that the finding of the Honorable Court that it was in the public interest to detain the applicant was an erroneous interpretation of the public interest matrix and inconsistent with the settled principles and thereby negates the fundamental rights, freedoms, and liberties as set forth in Article 29 of the Constitution. The applicant argues that the court's decision was not proportionate in balancing the rights and liberties of the applicant against alleged public interest. The applicant argues that our jurisprudence has now established that when individual liberties come into conflict with national security, it is the latter which must give way, not the other way around. Second, the court breached, um, uh, the applicant argues that the court breached the fair trial rights of the applicant by stating merely on the basis of the state affidavits that the applicant's utterances amount to hate speech. Third, the applicant argues that it was an error for the court to have held that the applicant can be held in, det in detention, notwithstanding that there was no holding charge 
preferred against it. The applicant argues that the police have no authority in law to arrest and detain any person without sufficient grounds and without informing of the reasons of his arrest as required under Article 49.1a of the Constitution. Fourth, the applicant argues that it was an error for the court to conclude that the applicant would interfere with unknown and undisclosed witnesses merely by the fact that the applicant is a member of parliament for red constituency and therefore influential. The applicant argued, placing reliance on uh, William Kipkorir Kipchichirpe case, as well as the Deutsch Sagare case, that for the prosecution to succeed in persuading um, uh, the court of this criteria of interference, it must, play, it must place material before the court which demonstrates actual or perceived interference, and that just suspicions and fears harbored by the prosecution are not enough. The state, on the other hand, supported the learned magistrate's findings and conclusions, insisting that it had persuaded the court on the basis of the materials it placed before it, that it was in the interest of uh, it was in the interest of public security and order that the state is allowed to complete investigations before Mr. Sudi is released. Mr. Karuri argued that the state complied with Article 49.1 G and H of the Constitution because the state informed the applicant the reasons of his complete detention, which was that his immense influence in Capsaret would undermine efforts to record statements from potential witnesses. Mr. Karuri argued that the state was still conducting investigations and that it was incumbent upon the court to protect the integrity of the criminal justice system by ordering the continued detention of the applicant until the investigations are complete, to the credible fear that he will undermine those investigations. Mr. Karuri submitted that the interests of justice demand the protection of the investigation process against prob uh, uh, probable hindrance by would-be accused persons. On the question why the state has not preferred a holding charge, Mr. Karuri argued that such a position would be untenable because such a charge would not be accurate in its particulars, hence undermining the foundation of principle of certainty of charges as provided uh, in Article 124 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Mr. Karuri, however, submitted that should the court be persuaded to grant bail, then it should bind the applicant, as he has already pledged his affidavit, supporting affidavit, to keep the peace and not to make comments which might incite the public. It is probably rhetorically symmetrical, linguistically aesthetic, as well as structurally sound, for reasons which will emerge shortly. To begin with the applicant's most strident argument. That argument is that the judicial imprimatur given to the action of the police and the NCIC to hold the applicant in continued detention in the absence of a formal charge or holding charge is, per se, unconstitutional. The argument is that holding an arrested person beyond the 24-hour period prescribed in Article 491F of the Constitution without charging them with an offense not to law is categorically violative of the Constitution. My senior brother, Kimaru, uh, Kimaru J, uh, in Michael Rotich's Republic uh, case, was of the opinion that a correct reading of Articles 29 and 49 of the Constitution means the result proposed by the applicant. I've quoted at length uh, what uh, Justice Kimaru says in the Rotich case. Article 49.1F of the Constitution provides as follows. An arrested person has the right to be brought before a court as soon as reasonably possible, but no later than, one, 24 hours after being arrested, and then G, at the first court appearance, to be charged or informed of the reason for the detention continuing or to be released, and H, to be released on board of bail on reasonable conditions pending a charge or trial unless there are compelling reasons not to be released. The court, in the Michael Rotich case I just cited, while decrying the ubiquitous use of pre-charge detention, 
rules that the, uh, the constitutional meaning of to be informed of the reason for the detention of any, which is the constitutional words used, can only be met with the presentation of a holding charge at the very minimum. There are good reasons for this purposeful reading of the Constitution. Why should the police arrest a citizen if they do not even have a provisional view of the offense the citizen has committed? It would seem repugnant to the ethos of the constitutional justification of the exercise of power and authority in which our Constitution is stepped, is stepped in to encourage such practice, even if not categorically and constitutionally history. In many cases, such police action would be in context and effect and constitutional. This would be the case where the police con conduct, for example, reveals a pattern or desire to overreach or to deploy the criminal justice system in a manner which unnecessarily diminishes rather than aggrandizes personal liberty or autonomy of the arrested individual. So, even while accepting that the text of Article 49 1F may, in certain circumstances and contexts, comprehend a situation where a person is presented before a court without being formally charged and is thereby informed of the reasons for his continued detention through the state's application to have him so held, the state must, in my view, satisfy a double test. First, the state must persuade the court that it is acting in absolute good faith and that the continued detention of the individual without a charge being preferred, whether provisional or otherwise, is inevitable due to existing exceptional circumstances. Second, the state must demonstrate that the continued detention of the individual without charge is the least restrictive action it can take in balancing the quadruple interest present in a potential criminal trial. That is, the rights of the arrested individual, the public interest order and security, the need to preserve the integrity of the administration of justice, and lastly, the interest of the victims of crime where appropriate. By virtue of Articles 21.1, and 259 of the Constitution, the court must act to aggrandize and not diminish the personal liberties of arrested individuals in line with the other three interests. Differently put, the state must demonstrate that there are compelling reasons to deny pre-charge bail while balancing all factors within a complex permutation presented by this quadruple interest and without reifying or essentializing any. This framing of the test combines the four arguments the applicant made into a single multi-pronged weighted test. I will now apply it to the facts of the case. Can it be said that the state here is acting in absolute good faith and that the continued detention of the applicant without a charge being preferred, whether provisional or otherwise, is inevitable due to existing exceptional circumstances? The state's preferred reasons for the continued detention, which were accepted by the learned magistrate, were two. First, that the applicant exercises great influence on members of the public by virtue of his being a member of parliament, and that, therefore, releasing him created a foreseeable risk that he will interfere with the investigation. Second, that given the charge he faces, and given the, uh, that there have been demonstrations against the applicant, his release from custody will disturb public order, peace, and security. Do these two reasons meet the high threshold in the double test I have synthesized above? I think they do not. I say so for at least three reasons. First, the argument that the applicant is likely to interfere with witnesses because he's a man of immense persuasion and influence seems eminently pretextual for at least two reasons. One. Looking at the offenses that this, the state says it hopes to charge the applicant with, it appears to be a stretch on credibility to posit that any witness would be unduly influenced by the <laughs> One, the critical elements of hate speech are provable not through individual witnesses who might come under the influence of the applicant, but by, a sh but by showing the ordinary import of the words uttered by the applicant were calculated to incite members of the public. Mm -hmm. Two, assault on a police officer would be proved not by a member of the public who may be susceptible 
to wither under the influence of his MP during investigations, but by the police officer who was allegedly assaulted. Three, unlawful possession of firearms and ammunition is proved as the learned magistrate's ruling correctly held through forensic documentary and expert evidence. Four, resisting arrest is also provable through the factual evidence of police officers who were present at the time of the attempt, attempted arrest. And five, it is unclear what the offense of committing offensive contract, uh, conduct would entail in the circumstances here, but such generality and nebulousness of the allegations cannot be a ground for limiting constitutional rights of an accused person. Two, the state made no efforts whatsoever to demonstrate which witnesses would be interfered with and how such interference would happen at the investigation stage given the offenses contemplated. It is not enough to proclaim that an arrested person will influence in his line of business, profession, trade, or occupation. In order to restrict the person's right to be released on pre-charge day, the state must credibly and specifically demonstrate the likelihood of such interference. Second, the argument that the interests of public order, peace, and security necessitate the pre-charge detention of the applicant because his speech has led to, quote, unquote, demonstrations against him does not meet, in my view, the high threshold of compelling test required by our Constitution. The reason given appears illogical when set against the granted remedy to hold the applicant without charging him for seven days, then releasing him. There is no indication how holding the applicant for precisely seven more days will dissipate the public order, peace, and security risk his alleged utterance costs. I have noted that there is no allegation that the applicant has threatened to make like utterances if they are indeed capable of inciting the public. In any event, the applicant has demonstrated a willingness to abide by the condition to make not to make any comment akin to the ones the state finds insalubrious and capable of inciting the public. What then is the logic of his continued detention? In short, the radical remedy prayed for and granted to the state, which is to hold the applicant without charge for seven more days, is not rationally related to the alleged risk. There is a second reason to worry about the contextual and simplistic pitting of public order, peace, and security on the one hand against the personal liberty, interest, and autonomy of the applicant on the other. It is that the logic espoused by this simplistic pitting is a dangerous anti-liberty ethos which was rejected by the Constitution of Kenya 2010. I clearly expressed this reasoning in Joseph Piongo and 17 Others versus Republic, and it is sufficient to reproduce the relevant paragraphs. And I quote from that case, the defense would be correct to argue, this was a, uh, this was a similar case that uh, was in, um, in Kiambu, and this is what I said in that case. The defense would be correct to argue that such a bland response to the breakdown in law and order would be tantamount to sacrificing the rights of the accused person in order to secure peace and security for the rest of society. Needless to say, our constitution no longer countenances such an approach. Such was the approach to law and order that justified the authoring into our law books the infamous Public Order and Security Act. The logic that it is necessary to simply detain some quote-unquote dangerous citizen in order to maintain law and order for the rest of the society. That logic has been substituted in our constitution with the opposite logic, that every accused person is presumed innocent and is entitled to bail and not to remain in remand unless compelling reasons are shown. The authority of the court to deny bail where compelling reasons are shown can now not be invoked as a reason for the security apparatuses and the state to refuse to undertake their foremost duty to protect all citizens and maintain law and order in the society. Where the alleged sources of threat are known, 
and the potential victims of the illicit activities are known, it would be to reduce the state's monopoly of violence and duty to protect its citizens to a sacrilegious impotence to conclude that the only that only uh, the remanding of particular accused persons or suspects who are not themselves alleged uh, sources of threats is the method to protect the potential victims and public order. Having reached here in my analysis, the result appears eminently tautological. The application herein largely succeeds. There are no compelling reasons for the continued pre-charge detention of the applicant. All the concerns raised by the state can be accommodated without the very radical measures sought and granted to the state to hold the applicant uh, uh, pre-charge for 11 days in the circumstances of this case. I must return to the words I stated in the Joseph Temo case that I cited before. And they are, I'm obliged to observe that the pathway to peace and justice chosen by our constitution is one that assumes that aggrandizing personal autonomy and liberties, especially in the context of a criminal trial, is one that ensures our optimum aggregate collective peace, security, and justice more than the alternative path that limits individual liberties in order to safeguard these important values and outcomes. Ours is a constitution that wisely assumes that peace, security, and justice can be achieved in the context of the rule of law. For this to happen, each of the actors in the governance, law, order, and security sector must play the rightful role in ensuring sustainable peace, prosperity, and security. The disposition of the application then is as follows. A. The applicant, Sudi Oscar Kipchumba, shall be admitted to bail in the sum of Kenya shillings 500,000 with respect to all the charges the state contemplates to bring against him as covered by the state's application before the lower court. Alternatively, the applicant shall be released on his own personal recognizance of Kenya shillings 1 million and one surety of similar sum. These bail bond terms shall remain in effect and shall only expire upon the formal charging of the applicant with a disclosed offense or offenses. Upon such eventuality, the trial court shall be at liberty to set its own bail bond terms. B, the applicant shall not, and I hope Mr. Sudi is listening here, Carefully. I'm so careful. Mr. Sudi, are you listening here carefully? I'm listening very carefully. This is to you, not to your attorneys, okay? <laughs> so, the applicant shall not, shall not, before a charging decision is made in this case and thereafter until the order is varied by the trial court, make any public utterances or comments akin to those he is alleged to have made, which the state alleges are capable of inflaming public passions and hostilities among communities. C. The applicant shall desist from addressing any public rally before investigations into this case are complete and a charging decision made. Okay, so the third one, I've only limited it to until a charging decision is made. After that, you can address public rallies, okay? <laughs> uh, D, the applicant shall report to any police station as summoned by the investigating officer for purposes of completing investigations. E, the state shall be at liberty to charge the applicant with any disclosed offenses once investigations are complete and charging decisions made. Meanwhile, F, the applicant, shall, this is for you, Mr. Karuri, the applicant shall not be arrested or detained by the police if a decision to charge him is made 
he shall be summoned to present himself to court to take plea. Lastly, each party will be at liberty to apply for any further orders. I think you are still muted, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Lord, on behalf of the applicant, we thank you most sincerely yes. for giving us an opportunity to develop the law and to assert the authority of the sovereign of the people of Kenya. We are very grateful. Be blessed and have a good weekend. We'll take uh, Mr. Sudi all the way to Kapsaret in confinement so that he doesn't speak about the things. <laughs> <laughs> I think you so much, uh, It appears you might need, uh, you, might, you probably might need the duct tape um, to keep him out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I thought to design a leather mask. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Karuri, you have anything to say? Uh, much obliged, my lord, for your wise uh, ruling. We are very grateful. We are developing the law. And uh, just to remind the applicant that he's required on the 23rd of this month, before the magistrate's court. Before the CM? Yes, my lord. That was yeah, much obliged and to the president and my fellow colleagues, thank you so much. At Santini Sana, the, the ruling will be available with my court assistant in the next five minutes, so it will be sent to the email to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
さあ行くかさあ Jepul itu, eh, jepul nu, tu bapak mengapa kerja kerja? Jepul itu, eh, jepul nu, tu bapak mengapa kerja kerja? Jepul itu, eh, jepul nu, tu bapak mengapa kerja kerja? Mas é meu angia, oiu, oiu, mas é meu, 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 Hey, what are you doing?